Hello, welcome to the women's show. It's me again, Chris Brack, and I am joined today by Neil Ackerson and Philip Smallwood. And we're just going to talk about how boss Liverpool women are because we are officially now at WSL and we can talk about how great the uh, promotion was and how good it was to watch the fireworks. How are we doing, guys? Very yeah. good indeed. <laughs> it's what we've been looking forward to, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, it, was, it was the point of the whole season, Chris, and I think that, you know, let's sort of start there. Yeah, mm. the, they had to do it this year for a variety of reasons, you know, financial, but I think also for the the spiritual aspect, really, like the club needed them to to find a way through this. There was a, a massive push made internally and externally to, to, to grab people's attention. And I think that, you know, going to that game against Sheffield United, you're able to say that that was a success to this point. And all of this is, you know, the, the next part of all of this as well, which can sound brutal, but it doesn't need to be, is that, you know, to this point, because there's stuff to do next. But you know, when we started doing all of this, all the way from the start of the season, the conversations we've had since day one, we've needed them to do what they, they, they eventually managed mm. to do. And in the end, you know, you, you look at the table and it feels sort of downright, it almost feels too easy, if anything. You know, the, the, we've had a couple of conversations and it was a little bit more forth. And then there's, no, exactly. And there's points through the season where it just didn't feel it either. And as it is, in the end, you know, the old, there's a bit of a maxim to bear in mind, which is that, there's a reason why sides when you when they are sort of seven points behind you after 17 games say a seven points behind you because they're just going to stay on that trajectory and they can't quite get their act together but ultimately you know Liverpool to, to finish it 11 points clear it's just testament to, to to how well they've done the job that was in front of them and it's worth remembering that job will have come with massive pressure definitely definitely um Philippa we were at Sheffield Sheffield uh yeah. when you were given when you're giving out cream eggs to everyone and <laughs> the massive Katie Stengel flag was going it was it was really won it yeah I really enjoyed it I mean it almost felt like the whole season was kind of building up to to what ended up being this party against Sheffield United and I know earlier on in the season we were hoping that would be the case um you know and that that, that match could have been at Anfield and um unfortunately it landed on the same day as the derby so mm. you know that wasn't possible in the end but I know that the club really wanted to do that as well um you know, as the season was going on, and it just didn't quite fall right for us. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a really great atmosphere, and obviously the the players put on a bit of a show for us, didn't they? So, uh, which is always nice, uh, helps the party atmosphere even more, I would say. So, it was definitely a, a here come the champions. Uh, a little bit, you and me both know. Um, there's a little bit poetic about it being Sheffield United. The amount of ex Reds there, the former Reds manager who divides opinion. So it was quite nice to put that show on um, what they could, what we could, we were capable of, and we showed it most of the season. But there is something about just putting six past someone you don't see it that often. No, exactly, and you know, I think it's what comes with there being no pressure on the players as well. At that point, um, you know, the job was done, and they they could literally relax and play a bit more naturally. I would say I think sometimes when the pressure's on, you can you know overthink things sometimes and maybe not not play with the same flow as what they had in that game. Um, and you know there was a really good crowd on as well, over two thousand people, and you kind of hope that a lot of those people that maybe it was the first or only the second time are going to watch the game. You know that they they come again next season, and that you know the word starts to spread, and you know the crowds go up as as they're watching more and more world class players in the WSL next season. So, um, you know, it was it was just a really good day, and then obviously you can go on from that to to the derby, which was nice as well. You know, just having it almost, um, you know, they 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 managed to bring the kickoff forward so that you know people could go and watch both. And I think that's a big thing that they need to look at next season as well is. You know, mm. to try and get it so that there is no clashes between the two games and, and people can take in both without jeopardising uh, either attendances. Yeah, there was, that was one thing. There was probably too many of them, unfortunately. I mean, look, the cup final can't be helped. It is it is what it is, unfortunately. But there were a few, as you would like to think in hindsight, could have been done slightly differently. Uh, but look, ultimately, uh, the big thing is, I think it's a good thing for the players, and I think for us as fans to get used to it, is the amount of... Now, there should be a lot of hype around winning a league and you should have that but you know it was the amount of coverage it got and the amount of national coverage it got is that's one of the players and us fans you're going to get used to because the one thing is when you're with WSL is every game's on either on telly or on, or on the or on the um, FA player so you're going to have to get used to that now all eyes are on you know you know yeah exactly. before really 
Yeah, I mean, it was nice as well, I think, at the weekend, um, you know, that the club, you know, had them parade the trophy at, at Anfield. I think, you know, the reception that they got um, took me a little bit by surprise. Um, I know it has had, you know, a fair bit of coverage, but mm. I didn't expect um, there to be quite as... Uh, as many people staying behind, I think, at half time and not going down into the concourse and taking that in and giving them the reception that that they thoroughly deserve for for their achievements this season. And you know, I hope I hope that's a sign of things to come that people will come to the games more and um, that we'll get to play at Anfield a couple of times next season. And and you know that people will come in the droves to watch them because you know we know ourselves how much we enjoy going and watching the women play. And you know, it's 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 something that you know we should be getting more people going to watch um there should be larger crowds um and you know the the women deserve that you know the standard of player that we've got now in the WSL I think I think deserves big crowds and and it's something that I want to see it's the, the there's a problem here though which is that and this is we've got to be careful on a show like this one where there's there's a lot to applaud from last season and this is what I meant before when I referred to you know, this being a, a, in a couple of ways just a slightly sort of difficult moment. When Philippa says of she wants, you know, next season that people will be able to see world class players in the in the WSL, we need them to be playing for Liverpool. Yeah, there there, there cannot be um, ultimately, you know, to and it, and it all feels a little bit. What have you done for me lately? And I, and I do feel sorry for people at the club in that regard. But genuinely, it starts now. You know, Leicester mm. have stayed up with four wins from twenty two. Birmingham have gone down with three wins from 22. Now, 11th isn't good enough. It, it may be that 11th has to be what we have to deal on at the end of the season for one reason or another. But if we want to build on the momentum of, for instance, people, you know, really warm ovations at Anfield, the idea of playing two, ideally four, of the 22 league games at Anfield next season, I think there's opportunity to do that. But if we want to really build on that, then I think you've got to... You know, you've got to pick your moments. You've got to find your way. Liverpool are in a unique position for next season from the point of view of attendance, which is that it's overstated the lack of interest that is in the England national team amongst Liverpool supporter base. Men's supporter base is overstated, I would argue. Uh, those who don't, who are not interested are very, very vocal. There's a lot of people who are in a bit of a grey area and then there's some people who are interested who tend to not be particularly vocal. But what Liverpool women can do next year is if they can get the opportunity to play at Anfield, they can play on the fact that you can watch a Liverpool women's team, a Liverpool team play. It'll be a Liverpool women's team play in November and December next year. And that is a unique selling point. That will not be the same for Chelsea supporters, mm -hmm. for Arsenal supporters, for Tottenham supporters, for Manchester City mm -hmm. supporters, for Reading supporters. They'll want to watch the World Cup. They'll want to watch the Men's World Cup. The casual supporters of those clubs will want to watch the Men's World Cup. Whereas Liverpool can do that. But what they can't do is get them to Anfield and have them experience the sort of results that Chelsea put on Leicester. Because people yeah. go, I'm not, I'm, I, what am I watching this for? I'm not, I'm not signing up to watch a Liverpool team get whacked. And I watched Chelsea, uh, in, partly in prep for the show, to be honest with you. I watched Chelsea Manchester United yesterday, and Chelsea are incredible. Like, they're, they're yeah. such a good football team. They are, they were streets ahead of United. United get only get to where they get to in the game by virtue of nerves of Chelsea a little bit, really, in that first half. And a bit of luck, ultimately, just throwing a few high balls in and seeing where it ends up. Second half, Chelsea dismantled them. United have won 12 out of 22 in the division. They've got 42 points. This is a this that's a side that's prospered in the division. And Chelsea put four past them. And if Chelsea had needed to score six, they'd have scored six. They absolutely dismantle them second half. And this is the thing we've got to have for next season. And I think this is what Philip is driving at as well. Is that you know, we've got we we I think there's 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 I think Chelsea, Chelsea. The, I mean, the league table belies it a little bit because Arsenal are close to them. But I think that Chelsea, Chelsea and Arsenal say are currently in a bit of a league of their own. City can join them. Then there's maybe another league underneath that's United, perhaps down to say around sort of Brighton, and then there's then there's the next sort of step down, and then there's where Leicester and Birmingham ended up. But Liverpool can't do a year being where Leicester and Birmingham ended up. So I think, and I, I think the step up is so 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 huge. But it isn't just the one step up, the step up to that league or the step up to where Brighton are. It is the idea of you can't have Liverpool teams getting whacked six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and mm. that's what scares the life out of me because I want the, I want you know I want fifty five thousand at Anfield, I want two thousand at Prenton Park, yeah, and then three thousand at Prenton Park and five thousand at Prenton Park, but then I want fifty five thousand at Anfield, but it's hard to get fifty five thousand to Anfield if they're getting whacked six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. 
and 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 by anyone, but certainly by say a Chelsea team or a Manchester City team. So we've got to keep building. And as I say, it all sounds rather what have you done for me lately? And it all sounds rather, you know, it can all sound a little bit unpleasant. But that's now that's now the next thing. And that's what I said before when I was starting this, that there are some who've done the bit now. For, for us and there's now more that's got to come and that, that that's for at all levels the way the club works there's now more that's got to come and as i say it can sound all a bit gracious ungracious and a bit <laughs> a bit mealy now but, uh, yeah. but it is the next thing isn't it you can't we we can't be watching a liverpool side get beaten heavily three or four times a season no but it's it's the same thing we it's true in any level of football is if you stand still you're ultimately going backwards and liverpool know that but philip of the noise for getting out the club already is it's getting well briefed I would say to people in the press, Emma Sanders is it's five in, five out. That's pretty much that number's sort of getting banded around for now. Who the names are and the level of play we're getting in and out. Yeah, that that can be up for debate, and we'll only see the proof when when they land. But Liverpool, pretty much since they got promoted, that number's been banded about four to five are going out and four to five are staying. So it it's already shown a bit of a ruthless streak in Liverpool. Now, look, some of them I think is just natural players leave because contracts end or there's some players you think I've just got like a natural end to they're going to move on we can you know I'm not going to name names because I think that's mean at the moment but yeah. I'm intrigued to know the profile player we're going to bring in is it younger up-and-comers like we tried to do years back with Baba GD or is it experienced WSL pros who are maybe not quite Chelsea Arsenal level and the, perhaps the but they're still very top half WSL level to push us on I suppose that's the that would be the interest to see is how do we get the mix right? Yeah, I mean it's interesting when you know you you listen to what Matt's saying. Um, you know, he's he's coming out with words like we want WSL players with experience, we want internationals with experience. And I think I think the club are doing or are trying to do exactly what Neil's saying. You know, mm. whichever players are leaving the club, we need to be replacing them with better. It can't be the same standard or it can't be just you know players to make up the squad it's got to be players who are coming in to play on a regular basis and to take us up to that that next level and I think you know I'm I'm one of those I don't want us to make too many changes I think four or five is about right to be honest um you know I think there's enough players there with enough quality to keep us in the league but the sort of players that I want us to bring in are those that are going to make it a lot more comfortable for us staying in the league um, than what it has been for the likes of Leicester. Um, yeah. You know, I want us to to at least be finishing mid-table, I would say. I think that would be a successful season for us next year and then you'd then make the next step again. Um, I totally get what Neil's saying there about, you know, you don't want to be losing games 4-5-6-0. Um, I think, you know, it's probably a step too far to be saying that we should be beating the likes of Chelsea, Arsenal, Absolutely. et cetera. I but absolutely agree. I I think that this season has shown us that we've got a really good defensive unit. We're quite well organised. And I think that stands us in really good stead for next season to to not be getting, you know, battered in these games, you know, that to be going in them and being able to keep those teams out. Um and maybe, you know, losing games one, two, nil isn't isn't bad results for us in those games, but you know, it's something that we we need to be kind of building that platform so that we can then make the next step the next season as well. I think I think if it's five in and five out, then the five have all got to be nailed on starters who could yeah. start for a side up to, and I would say including Manchester United. I yeah. think that's the level that you've got to go to. I think the idea of reaching beyond that becomes very, very difficult because if they were good enough to start for the three clubs above, then they'd be playing for the three clubs above mm. or, or somewhere else across Europe. But I think it's got to be, if you're doing five in, it's got to be five in, but five in off the basis of the fact that you're going to be, you're the first of the nucleus of what's going to be in three years' time a genuine assault on the top three or four within the division. Uh, and that's, you know, really, really important that Liverpool therefore get that right. And it's 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 in the standards of women's football, it'll prove to be quite a substantial investment because these players will be, you know, you, 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 they're investing in the idea of playing for Liverpool and being at the centre of Liverpool and what Liverpool can do. And therefore having a really clear plan as well about, for instance, how many games there's going to be at Anfield and why. And all of that will obviously help dangle that particular carrot because this is what you're coming to do. We, we, we can obviously convince people with money, but they're still coming to play for a promoted side. So they've got to believe that Liverpool are very, very real in terms of in terms of taking a run at it. 
like Philip, I don't expect, you know, next season, it's not about beating Chelsea and Arsenal. That's not my point. My point is yeah. not getting battered. My point is not getting embarrassed. I'm not getting yeah. embarrassed in front of a crowd. What happens to Leicester at the King Power is quietly a little bit mortifying. And I mean that in a sort of, with the, with the greatest of respect to Leicester, who finished ahead of Liverpool last year. But the idea of you get everyone into the King Power to watch them play Chelsea and then get beat 9-0 is not a, it's not the sort of thing that it makes it easy to bring people back for afterwards. And if it does, at Leicester's level, that would not be the feeling of a Liverpool crowd, is the thing I would put yeah. over. Yeah. If, if that's happening on your turf, the idea of talking people back who maybe have never gone to a women's game before, but you're bringing them to Anfield for the first time and you're getting them excited, and then they're watching Liverpool, Liverpool be thoroughly outclassed, I think that would be a real problem. You know, and I'm I'm thinking here as much about the sort of the long term viability of the whole project. It, it would be awful now to take a step back, as you said before, Chris. So I think if it's five in, if it's only five in, and I think it should be more, and I've got a bit of a difference of opinion with Philip on it. But I think if it's only five in, then they have to be five who I think going through the spine of the team and who are absolutely you know, coming in and the expectation is that they will start the majority, the vast majority of games. And then it's down to the remaining players to prove that wrong. I.e. The le- they drag the level of everybody else up and everybody else suddenly is 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 absolutely deadly serious. I'm, well, I don't want to lose my place to this person, but therefore I've got to go up and up and up. And I think that yeah. that's what Liverpool have got to do. And it's got to be the right characters, obviously, in the right balance. And it isn't about burning everything down because the players who've done what they've done for us this season couldn't have done any more and they couldn't be worthy of greater respect. But, the challenge that the step up is, I don't think I don't think we get anywhere both on on conversations like these and among supporters, conversations among supporters in or not that aren't recorded, and the idea of what's internal within Liverpool uh, and in the media. I don't think we get anywhere by anywhere good by acting as though the step up isn't enormous. The step right. up is ab- the step up is absolutely enormous. I would argue the step up is bigger than the step up in the men's game at the moment. Yeah. And yeah. the men's game at the moment's got a massive problem with the difference between Premier League and Championship and what happens to newly promoted sides. And I think the step up is bigger here. Certainly between from the top three to, to then down to the, the promoted players. So I think that it's I think it's enormous. And I think that there's one other thing as well. And I take Philippa's point on the defensive units, but I think a lot of what Liverpool have shown brilliantly this year. And it's been unreal graft, I'm sure, is the benefits of the quality of training, the professionalism. Liverpool were the fittest team in the championship, I think. And a lot of, therefore, the tactical decisions that the manager was able to make about the back three, back five, only two midfielders, three attackers in amongst this, I think was massively boosted by the fact that Liverpool had a confidence they were fitter than everybody else they were playing. That has gone. That has gone from day one. Uh, we're coming up against players who are fitter than us. So it's not just a technical step up. Coming up players who are fitter than us and have had better fa- and have better facilities than us and have had better facilities than us for a longer period of time through their own development. They are fitter than us from day one, and we'll need to remember that as well. That you know, and I think that the the, the women's the women will be in for a big summer. I think in terms of the fact that they thought they were fit this year, it's going to have to go again. And it's going to be really, really tough. And and, and that's another deciding. And it wouldn't surprise me if there's maybe a couple of departures. Some people, some of us might think are a little bit surprising, but it may be as much a question as, as uh, around fitness as it is around uh, as it is around technical ability at this point from a Liverpool point of view. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we talked about four 0 I think Philip and we you may have talked many times at the ground is this three four three that we play, while it's it's wild and it's great fun to watch. I think we saw in the Arsenal game against the better side, it leaves you too exposed. And I do think that's going to be... And ultimately, I don't think that was the formation Matt wanted to do at the start of the season. It's more of a... Not he stumbled across it. It was an adaptation to what happened in the first game and went, it's not quite the balance we want. So I do think that... You would think that maybe influences who, who we bring in. Because I do think there'll be players leaving from positions going, well, who's going to play wide? And going, maybe we don't have a front three. Maybe it's a front two. And it's it's packed the midfield a bit more. I do sort of think that's where we struggle. Because actually, I thought against an Arsenal, which I think is where I do think Chelsea are a level above Arsenal is. Defensively, I thought you could get at them with pace. Whereas with Chelsea, I don't think it matters if you've got physicality, pace or anything. Chelsea just run you over. I think they're just that type of side. And obviously, ultimately, that's where you want to get to. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget. I mean, Chelsea's had that set up for... For years and years yeah, now, yeah. Emma Hayes has been there for years. She's she's been able to build this almost like super team in a sense, um, full of yeah. internationals, full of world class players. 
Um, and, you know, they are the standout team in, in the league. And I think for any side to kind of compete with them, they have to hope that Chelsea aren't quite at the races on their, on that day. Um, that's how good Chelsea are. Um, but I know that, you know, they've got quite a few um, that are going to be leaving this, you know, this summer. Um, so they've got a little bit of a rebuild going on as well. And it's whether or not, you know, other sides can maybe take advantage of that a little bit, maybe, you know, take take some of their players that, that are going to be leaving. Um, you know, because you know, we see this every single summer in the women's game, pretty much every team, it seems, are in kind of a new cycle every single summer. You know, there's that many short contracts for, for the female players that it's, it's almost like every single side has an all like almost like a rebuild every single season and it doesn't always work for them. You know, we've seen with Everton who've had an awful lot of investment over the last couple of years, you know, and they've really struggled this season. I think they finished in 10th, um, you know, and mm. it, it's very, very difficult, I think, for teams to get that right balance of the number of players. And that's why kind of like I'm a little bit different to Neil, where I think five is, is more than enough because you kind of need that stability as well. Um, you know, and only only next season will we know which is the right way for us to have gone with it. But, you know, the, there's there's such a huge step here, as Neil says. It it's, it's really is difficult to find that right balance, I think. But the one advantage that we do have is how much experience Matt Beard has got within this league. You know, he's been at Chelsea. You know, he was at West Ham, obviously he guided Liverpool to two titles. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think he, he's the right guy to kind of make that step for us and to, to get us into the into a decent position, I think, next season. I think I think that's, you know, what we need to focus on, not put too much pressure on the players, but I do not want us to be fighting relegation next season. Let's the, leave that to Everton. <laughs> the 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 idea, just on that note, I think if there's one thing Liverpool could invest in and could make them a little bit different, it is stability. So if you could find a way to to break the mould to an extent within women's football and find a little bit of a way to say we'll offer people three year deals, mm -hmm. as long as the footballers who Liverpool feel are confident can, and this is this is this, this you know, and this is if it is five, I think it's five that you're able to as a, hang your hat on for four or five years, yeah, and say that these are and I hang your hat on them from the point of view of the fact that they could still be doing what Liverpool need them to do in a in four or five years time, so that gives you a bit of a specific age range, but also be being able to do it in a, in a, in a universe where Liverpool are able to finish at the very least in the top half, if not sort of break the break where the top four is at the minute, because that the fact that there is so much instability always in amongst everybody from year by year gives Liverpool an opportunity to therefore firstly make stability a selling point, but also make stability a strength. I think that's kind of what they've done with Taylor Hines as well, though, Neil. You know, like she's mm. been a massive Defo. player for us the last couple of years and they've they've gone out there and they've said, right, here's a three-year deal for you. Yep. And, you know, she's exactly the sort of player that we should be doing that for in the right I, I think it shows range. the way that, Philippa. I think that shows it, that that's, that could be what the plan is. Exactly. And yeah. I think it's something that they need to do with the likes of Missy Bow as well. You know, hang the hat on her. You know, say, you know, we're investing in you for three or four years as well. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's exactly the right thing to do to be kind of like one of the, the teams that is going to do that because far too often we're seeing players being given one, two-year deals. And, you know, it... it you it's very play. difficult for, for female players, I think, to kind of like build any sort of stability for themselves in the home life as well. You know, they, they can't even get like mortgages for houses and things. And it's well, we, we saw that we saw that in the um West Ham documentary. Of, yeah, exactly. Uh, Kate Longhurst was talking about it. She's like, I can't get a house. Why? Because the contract could be gone in two years' time. How can I get that? But Matt Beard made an interesting comment. Was it Katie Stengel saying, uh, or I've worked before, so she's finally got a home. Yeah, exactly. for, um, having ha been very lucky to interview Katie, she's played all over the place, but it's like it felt like every year she was at a new club. Yeah, and she, she jokes like, you know, every year she buys a new, she has to buy all her appliances again. And we all made a laugh and a joke about how she, you know, she loves BM and Primark because she's rebuying it for her house. But thinking, like, that's got to get tired some other every year. I'm back in America next year, I'm in Australia. I mean, look, it's great, it's a great life. I'm sure she loves it, but you would like to stay at a club two, three years just to go. This is me. This is me doing my career. And also just a bit of stability. Because I'm not yes. sure I think about a suitcase every year because I think it'd do my head. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. I'll be quite honest. I couldn't do it. Even just moving within clubs within the same country, you know, uprooting your, 
your mm. family and you know your life every every year or two years it, you know it, it is very difficult for these players um and it's not something that we're used to to seeing within the men's game and you know i think i think neil's right i think if if liverpool can be at the forefront of maybe giving players a bit more of a a, a stable um situation i think i think that could be a real selling point of the club it could be and long term hopefully it's it maybe is that's a change that's coming in women's football i mean there is more money getting pumped into women's football with the BBC, with Sky, with BT. They're all starting to, you know, really, you know, invest in it. So you'd like to think if there's more investment in the clubs and more investment in the telly, you know, you should be able to be, give your players more stability, which can only long term improve the game because you can plan. You know, I've got this goalkeeper, I've got this spine of my side signed up for four years. We've seen it with the men's team. You know, most of the men's team signed up till 2024, 2025. You can plan around that now, go right there, there, and that's it. You know, so it's now just adding the the finishing touches, whereas yeah. you never get to the finishing touch with, with, with the women's team because every year you go, I've got to rebuy my spine every two years. That's that's for any manager, that's a nightmare to do. Yeah, it's crippling, absolutely crippling. So I think it's something that Liverpool suffered with, and part of the reason why they ended up being relegated because, as me and you know, Chris, we had quite a good side there, and it literally got decimated because yeah. my United came in, and it was like. They're offering them, you know, this big project and, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invest in the women's game and Liverpool dropped the ball and that's why we yeah. ended up where we are. But we we're kind of in that situation now where we can be at the forefront and making, you know, other teams follow us in a way. Um, yeah. So When you look back at that side, you know, we had a side that was underperforming mid-table, probably should have been pushing higher than what it is. And then... If you look at where 80% of that squad is now, they're at Man United, they're at Man City, they're at Chelsea, they're at Arsenal, or like uh, Gemma Bonner, they're, they're making waves in America. So yeah. they, had, they had the squad, they just didn't have the structure. Whereas, to be fair to Liverpool, they feel like they put the structure down. I mean, Russ, the new general manager, needs a lot of credit. He's done he's done well at West Ham. He did really well at Leicester. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. He's really switched on, very engaged. You know, Suzanne Black, you know, needs an awful lot of credit there. You could you feel like this time it there's a there's things in place, it's not lip service, which I think is something we could probably say that we could have accused the club of in the past. But I don't feel we're we're there now. I feel like we're we're on the road to a slight, to a better path. I, I think on that, you know, in the in the whole the, the, the whole piece around that, work with, with the club's partners as well and the idea of, of of new partnerships that can you know, in part be leveraged because of the women's team. But again, you need to have a successful women's team for that to be the case. And that's that is the opportunity now, and that's the significance of this. And it's why it's why making making a go of this, it's why stuff like but you know, seeing that there was a there was a genuine warmth, there was people who hung on for the ovation on um on Saturday was was really, really good. So I think that if we can, you know, if we can get that, if we can just keep that, it's all about virtuous circles all the way through every conversation I've had with anyone about this. I've said a win helps. And that's yeah. that's the thing that, the, you know, they've got to ensure that they, that we can keep doing. And obviously we can't really influence that. The players who've been, I'll say again, absolutely magnificent mm -hmm. and stood up under massive pressure over the course of the season in so many different ways. You know, you've got great performances like when they, when they relax and bang in six against Sheffield United on the one hand. And then you've got, you know, what were genuine serious how to win a league performances like going to Durham and winning 2-0 on the other uh real sort of blood and bone uh victories stuff like that in the you know in the, in the middle of November pulling together a massive battling performance with with so many players being so important and really penning Durham in stuff like that I think it it bodes well because I think there is a mental side to this for Liverpool because I do think there has been a bit of a weight of the share conversation uh around the idea that these are players playing for Liverpool but then that will continue if, again, if the results aren't there, that's when that shirt will feel really heavy. If the results are there, that's when that shirt, when you'll remember things like ovations at Anfield, if we can get to the point that there are games at Anfield and selling out games at Anfield, you know, that'd feel that'd feel absolutely incredible. I think it's fair to say. So it's it for me, it's still it's still a moment that's in the balance. Because if Liverpool can pull this off, then I think they, they can create a real level of virtuous enjoyment around this where everything feeds everything else. Everything feeds the corporate side. Everything feeds the fan enjoyment side. Everything fe fe feeds the players' side. That can work for, you know, it can power everything for five years. So it's a matter of keeping that and keeping that energy there and keeping that presence. And the, the, the first thing you need, 
and it's why it all feels a little bit unfair, is winning games. Winning games breeds the idea that everyone's got to feel good. You've not got to artificially conjure the feel good. You get to feast on the feel good instead. Cool. Well, while we talk about wins and feel goods, let's end on the positives. Let's just talk about some of the big moments of the of the season. Because let's be honest, there was loads. Liverpool top goal scorers of the league conceded the least goals. Twenty games undefeated out of twenty two. You know, you can't really ask for very much more. Probably if he had been nitpicky, twenty two out of twenty two would be nice. But you know, we can't, <laughs> we can't have everything. But if we go back to the very, I mean, the very first game of the season, Phil. But I know this is a bit of a downer, but I think this showed a difference. I would say. If I'm being honest, in the team, uh, I can only speak for me as a fan because you saw me after the, the Lionesses game. It was a tough loss to take. It was a game the Liverpool shouldn't have lost. They should have at least got a point out of it. Um, but it was the reaction after that, which I'll be honest, you know, I, can, I can openly admit as a fan, when you saw the one nil loss, you you can't help but think in your head, here we go again. So, yes. Please, please don't be another one of them seasons. And yeah. to be fair to Liverpool, they kicked on after that. But that was the kick in the teeth. And it was a big crowd we got for that game as well. And you were worrying yeah. how they all going to come back. I, I remember after the game, actually, being a bit disappointed with, you know, some of the comments that Matt said, because um, he kind of tried to say, you know, we don't need to win every game this season. And, you know, we need to remember that. And it was it was all the kinds of stuff that as a, a fan having experienced the season before, was the sort of thing you didn't want to hear. Yeah. But knowing now what had happened in the build-up to that game, I can totally understand why Matt was taking that kind of approach. And, you know, I think it's it's the sort of thing that, um, you know, at the end of the season, in hindsight, you can go, yeah, I can accept everything that happened there. Um, but when you're there and you're in the blood and thunder, you kind of want in that, that good start, you know, you wanted to win that game to kind of set us up for the rest of the season. Um, and I think it kind of showed what a massive uh, importance the Watford game was. You know, the very next mm-hmm. game where we, you know, we go 3-0 up and still manage to grind out a 3-2 win. Um, you know, it's a sort of game that we kind of needed to kind of build that platform for the rest of the season. And I don't think it can be underestimated how how important, you know, Rihanna Dean's goals were in that game. Um, I know it was pretty much the only thing she got to do for us, um, you know, which was put... unfortunate because of the injuries. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, that really did set us up for the rest of the season. And I think without getting the three points at Watford, you know, it could have been a very different story for us this season. It could have it could have turned into what, what happened last year, Um and you know it was it was really important that we managed to get that that win early doors, I would say, and um, to put us on the road to to getting promoted. It wasn't. We think you know. I mean, I mean she, she got clean sheets galore, but you know we lost Rachel Laws after the first game, and Riley Foster came in and did really well for two games. I mean, she actually kept Rachel Laws out for the Bristol game. So again, you've got early signs of the squad depth. And in first, Neil, um, as we've all joked, unlike myself, uh, Matt was calm whether it was a win or a loss um but to say by october you'll see us peak that's also as a manager that is putting yourself out there because we all know how the, the world works if by october we're not peaking that is going to get thrown at him i mean to be fair they probably peaked a little bit sooner than october and really kicked on but you know again you, you have to give credit to the manager he's he was such a calm and influence um on everyone i think the the october will peak thing i suspect he will have had sheffield united away in mind uh, mm-hmm. Which is which is almost like a warm up for the Durham game. Uh, again, go away from home, be much the better side. Win it two 0 Win it in the first half to all intents and purposes, uh, and say see you later. And I think that, that was that was what Liverpool managed to do that day. And I think he will have thought that. I think he, he will have felt there was that was the the, the general chatter from the club. And it, again, it's back to this idea that the, because there isn't stability uh, within women's football, I spent a lot of last summer sort of asking, well, who are the enemies here? Who do we need to worry about? And one of the, the names that kept coming back was Sheffield United. So I suspect Matt adds Sheffield United uh, in October on his list of that's what that's what we're going to look to do. And they do they play they play really well that day. And in the end, listen, there's a screamer in there, but two 0 really flatters Sheffield United uh, in, in in hindsight. Yeah. And over the course of the season, in the end, Liverpool scored eight past them because there's the later six that goes in as well. Um, but Liverpool just did enough that day. They got themselves ahead and they just kept Sheffield United at arm's length. And I think that's also a something which I think you get to see from the side as the the campaign wears on, you know, 
when you mentioned that in October, they don't concede at Coventry, they don't concede at Sheffield United, uh, they don't concede at home to, to lose, they don't concede in the Conti Cup then to Sheffield United, they don't concede to Blackburn, uh, and they don't concede to Durham in that run. And they don't win all those games. You know, let's be crystal clear, there's a couple of draws in there, but they absolutely just are keeping sides at arm's length and look substantially sort of superior in in, in a lot of different phases of, the, of play. And so there's that Sheffield United win and there's that Durham win. And I think that they should have bookmarked that run to an extent. And both of them, uh, you know, are absolutely integral. I think as much to the collective belief of we are the best team in this division. And I think that as soon as Liverpool settled into this idea that we are the best team in this division is the point at which they don't really look back. And, and, and also they tell everyone else that Liverpool are the best team in the division. And I think that that sort of helps for a long period as well. I think as we get towards the end of the season, everyone begins to maybe sort of free hit Liverpool a little bit and think, well, we'll just have a go and it doesn't matter because no one's expecting to get anything. But I think that around that period, everyone was still a bit like, oh God, uh, Liverpool are mm. the best team in that division and we don't want to be the ones they really demonstrate that against. Yeah, definitely. I mean, going back to uh, another one of my failed predictions, which I was very happy to get wrong, uh, Leanne Keane gets her first goals. <coughs> Uh, away to Coventry, and she never looks back. Uh, I'm quite happy to wear my my complete wrong suggestion of she's a good hard worker, but she might be more of a dirt cow or get a little chip with the odd goal. But she was just the pure instinct of Liverpool of once confidence hit, she was fabulous. Uh, couldn't really stop scoring until about March, and it just felt like every game now is well, Leanne will get one, and who gets the others? It just felt like that, and the Durham game is where it all sort of culminated with the greatest tackle I've ever seen by Rachel Furness, where she floors one of their players in the first 30 seconds. And having watched Liverpool against Durham uh, and speaking to uh, the ladies at Redmen TV, Durham's always the game I hate because you always got that. They just bully you. That's what they are. They're a good side, but they bully you. And Liverpool did not settle for that stand. Liverpool basically went to, we could play both ways. We, are, we can out -phys be more physical than you. And then class will tell. And Taylor Hines just kept scoring headers, which is always always handy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's hard to uh, kind of think back to like when we were a bit worried. You know, is Leanne Kernan ever going to score for us? Because in those first few games, it felt like it was all endeavour and not really getting anything to show Could for it. Good job, uh, it's not record, good job it's not recorded these phrases, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but then she, you know, she gets that first goal and then she's flying, isn't she? But um, we needed that, to be honest, because obviously Rihanna Dean got injured. Um, mm. You know, she needed to step in there and, and you know, to, to be the one to get us those goals. And I think she started out originally, like, kind of like playing right wing in a way. Um, and, you know, Rihanna was kind of the, the, the one through the middle. Um, and then obviously Rihanna got injured and she, she ended up being almost like the lone striker in a way, being supported by Yana Daniels and, and Mel Lawley. Um, and then obviously we then get Stengel in, in January and it's almost like she's been pushed back out again. And I think that's kind of like why the goals kind of, mm. you know, kind of dried up a little bit for her because she wasn't really playing you know, that, that striker role in a sense um, in a lot of those games. Um, but without her, you know, it's it's hard to imagine where we would have been this season. You know, she scored some absolutely crackers, but also some really vital goals in those games. And, you know, it. it I, th I think that's the thing for me. They, they just always seem to be that player that was able to step in and do what was needed of them at the right time. And, you know... Mm -hmm. Everybody played the part this season, you know, even those that, that maybe didn't get as much game time as, as what they would have liked, the likes of Ash Hodson. You know, they still chipped in with important roles. Georgia Walters, who ended up leaving in January. Well. You know, I remember there was a couple of games where, you know, early on where she she held the ball in the corner and it felt like nobody could get the ball off her. And, <laughs> you know, those, Lewis, those, Lewis those, at home, wasn't it? You were never getting it off her at Lewis at home. She just yeah, got there for five minutes. But those things stick in your mind and, you know, those players probably feel they didn't really play a, much of a part in this season. But, you know, the little things like that, that, you know, really do stick in your mind and, you know, you you look back on, you think, you know, I, I remember that. And, you know, I remember the part that those players uh, played in, in, in us actually achieving this. And I like to think that Georgia Walters got a, got a medal as well at the end uh, 
Yeah, she you did. Know, yeah, that, which was it that was nice Sheffield to see. Sheffield United that. game, which was uh, quite interesting. So yeah, Ble bless her. She looked surprised, like when they gave it to her. She, you can <laughs> yeah. see, like, oh, oh, I get one as well. Yeah, you go. So you can see, like, sort of walking up. She's probably the happiest person ever to get beat six one. Good. Pretty sick. Win the winners medal. That'll do me. Uh, I mean, one of my favourite games pre Christmas was Sunderland away, because back to back away games in the North East is hard, but Sunderland away is a is a tricky game, especially going one nil down, and. Lucky enough being there, it was a lively atmosphere there. But as, uh, as soon as he went one nil down, a switch in my head, and I think in Liverpool flicked, which was they went to serious football, and it was just like you're not getting out of here without the three points, and that was it. And you could just tell it was it literally felt at one nil down. This is a matter of when we win it. This is not if we win it. And that sounds I know it can sound supremely arrogant, but that's how it felt on the ground. It was just like going it's wave after wave after wave. And again, it was Yana Daniels. He wasn't expecting to score. Gets the opener, Leon Kiernan. And then Mel Lawley, who only got a couple this year, scores arguably one of the goals of the season. Uh, probably only edged out by Leon Kiernan against Blackburn. And you sort of go, that's just what they do. And at least I could hear Sutherland fans going, well, they only beat us 1-0 the second half with a, with a, a, you know, I think they were calling it a fluke goal. But, going, but that's what sides were thinking then is like, well, they only beat us by one in the second half. That was classed as a win. So that kind of went, whereas... You know, it's, it's a while since people have looked at Liverpool in that way, and it was great to see where sides think if we only get beat by two, I'm all right with that. That that that's a win for me as well. Let, let's let's move on to something else. Yeah, it was almost like damage limitation for a lot of sides for me um, to kind of make sure that they weren't getting like as we're saying if we go up to, well when we go up to the WSL now. Um, you know, we don't want to get hammered in games, and it kind of felt like a lot of teams were treating Liverpool like that, um, mm. and it was only towards the end of the season when Liverpool really relaxed and I think other sides who were playing against us were kind of like, this isn't the kind of game that we're targeting, that we you know, we were able to start like beating teams like Sheffield United 6-1, putting on a bit of a show. Um, but until that, you know, you could tell that there was a lot of pressure on, on the players on the side um, to get the job done. And, you know, I always go back to the Durham game. Unfortunately, I wasn't at the Sunderland game, but I know pretty much everybody who went to the Sunderland game picks that one out as their standout kind of game of the it's season. So, where it was it so kind of cold. Felt like this was where we're going to win the league. Um, you know, there yeah. just always seems to be that point for everybody. Uh, mine was Durham because it was the one before and I wasn't at Sunderland, but I know yeah. a lot of people do pick out but, that Sunderland game. The thing with that Sunderland game is it, was, it, it became the last league game until... With the, after the, after Christmas, so they they play a couple of cup games in December, but nothing else. And when they come back after Christmas, and I think part of this people decide in Liverpool's damage limitation is actually that first game back in January, because they absolutely take Blackburn to the cleaners. Yeah, I mean, so they, they, they go to they go away to Sunderland, they win three one, and then they go away to Blackburn and they win six nil. And I think that is the point at which for everybody else in the league, there is an element of damage limitation. I think the away game afterwards, it was around the time of my birthday, which is a terrible way to hook it in, but I think they score four at Palace. Yeah. And I think that yeah. that's, I don't really do that again until Sheffield United, but I think that what those two away games say to everyone is when you play Liverpool, you just want to get out with minimum, minimum damage. And I think that that's that, I think the same thing happened with Leicester last season as well, watching as it went right the way through. And I think that that's a really important moment and it's an important bit of learning really that you can, you know, yes, you only get three points for beating Blackburn 6-0 away, but actually the statement that it sends to to everybody else is is quite important. You know, Blackburn, they do finish 10th, and I think that, you know, if it wasn't for the deduction, Coventry probably have a better points total than them uh, in total. I'm not 100% on that, but I'm going to guess I'm right. You so you, you, <laughs> you can end up sort of, you know, saying, well, well, yeah, but we're not Blackburn, we're better than them. But I think just the idea of when you're playing Liverpool, you really just don't want to get... Uh, get a heavy drub and I think it helps and I think that that's something which Philip is right to sort of to, to 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 reframe that in next year's conversation but I think it is this it is what can be done by this side and what they've shown and and I think that, that I think th those two away games in January really really helped them um and then it's then it's a matter of 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 how they overcome just a little wobble that then takes us all the way into March. You know, there's there's they're not great at Charlton, but they get the job done. But there's two draws either side, and you began to wonder if the little wobble was going to become anything more. And quite the opposite, you know, the the brilliant from that point, and that's where they really do deserve credit. The manager deserves credit. They deserve credit for, credit for the courage. The pressure could have been on them, and actually they just shrug it off and and, and get the job done. Yeah, I mean, in January we bring in Katie Stengel, who 
comes against Blackburn, doesn't really get much involved. She gets like the last 20 minutes. And then she scores probably one of my favourite goals of the season, which is Watford at home, which was that felt like the eternal, it's one of those, it's a nil-nil, it's not happening. And then we saw Meg Campbell long throw, and it's a great header. And I think that's the most I've ever celebrated the goal. I think I nearly fell down the concourse. I was that excited. <laughs> it was brilliant. But that's when you look, because at the time, we just took Leanne Kane, and often you're all like, and look, all rounds were like taking top goal score off. It's a bit of it's a bit of a risk at nil nil. And then look, from what we know now, I mean, Stengel ended up with like double figures, uh, and only coming in January. I mean, she was again different striker, different dimension. Gave more physical aspect. She's very good at holding the ball up, but in between the posts, there's there's no one better at the moment. She just uh, she's just an absolute killer. And we saw that in the Palace away game, which Neil references. She was she was a nuisance all the way through. And again, she definitely looked like a player where you looked at. She's only agreed to six months of the championship. There's no way she's here next year if, if we if we're in the championship next year. Uh, so you know, again, the club not took a risk, but when we'll bring her in early, we'll make sure we get this almost WSL standard striker ready for next year. So it's like it's like one box ticked, which was really good. And the favorite game, Philippa, I'm sure it was you because you, you were sat next to me was the was the Bristol game yeah. where I was in bits all game. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think that was more to say than watching the game. They're just watching me collapse every time. Anything slightly went wrong. I think yeah. it's just one of those games where, like, you wanted it so much. I, th- I think it helped because, um, like, we were on the coach, obviously going down, and we we kind of got a bit of a party atmosphere going before we even got to Bristol. Um, I was actually quite relaxed for that game because it was it was very much like they have to beat us. Um, mm. So, and I, I I think I think what helped me was I'd watched the Sheffield United. Um, Bristol game where it ended up being um, Sheffield United beat Bristol 1-0 and I, I remember messaging Neil um, and I was just like we're going to get loads of goals against both of these sides because defensively they just looked like they wouldn't be able to cope with us um, you know you see some sides and you think yeah they're quite well organised and you can see them you know being able to cause your problems by not allowing you the space to be able to hurt them but it just felt like both Bristol and Sheffield United in that first half could have scored four or five goals each. And I thought if they do that against Liverpool, then I can see I can see Liverpool hurting both of them. And as it turned out, you know, we scored four against uh, Bristol and we scored six against Sheffield United. So I wasn't as concerned as what you were, Chris, going into I think, that. I, I think I, I think my head had just gone about a month ago. <laughs> my my head had gone. I think Neil's had great fun laughing at me. <laughs> I think I think on the on the, the 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 that weekend of the game that uh, the the Bristol game that that, that Philip refers to, they're not the one where we faced them, but the one where they faced Sheffield United. That's the twenty sixth, and then we go and beat Durham three 0 on the twenty seventh, mm. and that just sorts things out i think massively uh and then you know it's worth it's worth now remarking on because we you know we spoke before that that weekend it's worth now remarking on that bristol city don't win any of the last five yeah. so i had a little look uh earlier today and bristol city don't win any of the last five i was actually quite surprised to sort of know that I, it stemmed from me looking at the table going hang on i remember being really worried about bristol city in the fourth um and they don't win any of the last five and i think that that you know, the first of that run is the one against Sheffield United. Then there's, there's us and what we do to Durham, which is just a really good, another good consumer performance in there as well. You know, and, and suddenly it goes from feeling as though it could be a bit edgy when we go to Birmingham. Uh, and then I think you see that in 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 the way in which Rachel Finesse responds to the goals that she gets in the 3-0 against Durham. She celebrates them like she's absolutely possessed. It is. It is not enough just to have scored the goal, you know. And it felt genuinely as though as though messages were being sent simultaneously. You know, it really did. It was. Mm-hmm. It was genuinely, thrillingly aggressive from her. I felt in terms of the celebration, aggressive obviously to get the ball in the back of the net the way in which she does, but aggressive in terms of the celebration. The celebration was this is ours, this, and we're not messing about here. By the time they go to Bristol, you know, there's then they don't they only need a point because of the swing of that that weekend, and. It's much more straightforward because there's there's obviously then two more games beyond that. If it had gone to that, if Bristol had managed to hold Liverpool off, but even Bristol themselves at that point they've maybe wobbled because they've they've, they've, they've dropped points to Sheffield United, and so it goes. And I think that weekend becomes the key weekend of the run in. It's not it's not even the game. It looked like it was going to be the game against Bristol, but it actually becomes emphatically beating Durham 
uh, and not taking any messing in the process and, and and making it clear that that it wasn't going anywhere else. Excellent, excellent. So before we go, then um, I'll let you pick two key players that you, that have done it for you, impressed you. It could be whatever reason you've got, you've gone for. Uh, I'll go for uh, Kelly Holland uh, for me, who is the engine of that midfield, and I think Liverpool just don't function as well without her in the midfield. I think she sacrificed her natural game. I think her natural game is bombing on, getting goals, because that's what we what she was when we signed her. But she's been fabulous in that central midfield role f- for us. And I'll cheat the other one is uh, Rachel Laws. It's just clean sheets. Like I can see Neil's fuming over it already. She just loves clean sheets. But we were only picking one each. Two, and it, 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 oh, right, two. okay. Uh, I'll jump it in. Get I'll get the favourites first. <laughs> I was delighted. I was delighted when you didn't go for Rachel Laws because I, I was going to go for Rachel Laws. Uh, uh, I think Rachel Laws has been absolutely incredible, and you know, with with an eye on what is to come next, I think the position is in in tremendous hands. Uh, if it's in hers, I think she was she was mm, she was just consummate over the course of the campaign, uh, and I think that it's. I think it's one one to remember uh, in general how how strong she's been, the difference she's made, and the fact that she's she, she's she stood so strong all the way through. Um, the other one I'm going to go for is one, you know, I'm delighted I'm going for in that I think uh, Mel Lawley's ability over the course of the campaign to create genuine chaos in opposition defenders, both with and without the ball. I think that what one of the things that I think has come on massively. Watching it is the quality of the movements before she even receives it. She's able to pull defenders this way and that. Obviously, what always helps in that is if they are concerned, what happens if you then get the ball, which she shows with performances all the way through the campaign. But I think she's, I thought, I think she's been great to be honest. And I think that I think you've also seen her grow. So I think a couple, I think, have become a little bit less effective in general for Liverpool in a few different ways as the campaigns wore on. Whereas I felt as though every single time in the second half of the season, whether in the ground or on television, I've caught any Mel Lawley. Every single time, I've, I've almost felt as though she's improved from 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 a pretty strong base in the first half of the season. And I think that that's the value of confidence. So I think I'll go I'll go Rachel Laws and Mel Lawley. Good, good. Um, I'm going to go for Taylor Hines. Um, I think she's absolutely outstanding on that left hand side all season. Um, and there was even a point um, to kind of like shoehorn uh, Megan Campbell's long throws in where uh, Taylor played on the right side of uh, the okay, defence Bristol. and that was against Bristol. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I just think she's a sort of player that you should be hanging your hat on and it's good to see that Liverpool are doing that over the next three years, um, you know, keeping her in there. And I, I, I anticipate and I hope that she goes on to be a, an England um, international, I think she's that good. I think she could, you know, cement that place uh, within that squad. Um, not saying she'll necessarily start, but definitely having a place within that squad for me. Um, and then the other one for me has to be Leanne Kernan. Um, you know, I think without her goals, you know, the first half of the season in particular, um, I don't think we have the basis for what happens in the rest of the season. Um, you know. Just a work rate, you know, every single game, she just gives you absolutely everything that she's got. Um, and to add goals to it, I think, you know, she has to be in there for me. Um, and I would have gone for Rachel Laws if both of you hadn't have done. <laughs> <laughs> that's how, that's well, how good she, she's been, you know, the, the, yeah. the absolute kind of, you know, the, the, the stalwart in there to, to kind of build from, um, you know, and I think without her in, in the goal this season, I think, could have been a very different story uh, after what happened to Riley. So um, yeah. I think and the you mad, know, it's clear. And the mad thing is, there'll be people watching this who'll be shouting Furness, Dengel, Matt Beard, you yeah. know, as all standouts this season. And there are many more. Nifahi, Leanne Robe has been up until her injury, probably the most consistent centre back we had. Jazz Matthews. So you could reel off half a squad, and it's not, and you can make a genuine argument for about eight or nine players. Which is always out of a great, always out of a great season. Cool. So listen, I'll let you guys go because I, I promised a half an hour. And to be fair, I took the Mickey a little bit thinking this. <laughs> about a nice time. <laughs> so, uh, so listen, um, we're going to take a little break from the women's show now. Uh, have a have a summer break. Uh, give Neil and Philippa a rest before hopefully we bring you back for next se- next season. We're all talking WSL, and you know if we get any breaking news on any new signings, hopefully I can sweet talk Emma Sanders to come and explain it all to me. But, you know, <laughs> I, need to, 
I need to ask her nicely first. She'll do that. But listen, uh, Neil, Philippa, thank you very much for, for all your help this season. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for doing it. It's been great. No worries. So then, guys, take care of yourselves. Like, subscribe, and keep your eye on the women's team because we are going places. Thank you.